Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Dream Big Podcast with Bob Goff and friends. I'm your co-host Scott Schimmel. I'm here with Bob Goff. Hey everyone, I hope it's been a terrific week uh, that hasn't felt like Groundhog Day, like more of the same, but that it's actually different and inspiring and no better person to have a conversation with today than Don Miller. Yes, yeah, so much, this is an understatement, so much about the world has changed and we know many of you are running your own organization, running your own business, and you've had to deal with cancellations, changes, change plans, and we're all scrambling to figure out how do we respond. So in this conversation, you're gonna listen to uh, Bob and Don are talking about what are they doing, specifically Don, what is he doing to change the focus of his business? So take notes, if you're working on how to pivot your business and how to rethink and refocus, this is the right conversation for you. Yeah, one of the things I really enjoy, uh, not only after, many years of being friends with Don, is um, his ability to be nimble uh, and also very intuitive about this. And so some people knew Don when he was riding blue like jazz and he was like a hippie living in Portland in a bus or something. And uh, what he's done is this beautiful pivot to kind of keep up with himself and runs this fantastically uh, creative and successful marketing business. If you haven't dialed into story brand, uh, don't miss out on that. Um, but one of the things he reminds me of is to be super intentional about why you do what you do. And I hope for you, as you listen in today, that you'll develop a plan about like, why am I doing what I'm doing? And then figure out what's next. Don, thanks a million for joining us. I'm glad to be here. Hey, um, uh, this has been an unusual time by anybody's measure. And, uh, and one of the things we want to talk about is how we pivot and change in the overall arc of Dream Big. We're talking about finding an ambition, looking for an opportunity, taking action on that, expecting there'll be a couple setbacks, and that happened to Earth, uh, uh, but to sustain belief in the middle of it. So I want to talk about how have you made as a serial entrepreneur, how have you pivoted with the events that have unfolded because you've been given a lot of wisdom to a lot of people on that. Yeah. Well, we, you know, we have a business uh, story brand business made simple that is heavily dependent on, and I mean, probably 70 to 80% dependent upon people getting on airplanes and sitting in a room with each other. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they took away airplanes and rooms with each other. <laughs> so yes. Yeah, that's what they do. And uh, I think like most people, I spent about 48 hours, you know, figuring out what do we have in the cash reserves? How long can we go before we're starting to lay people off and those sorts of things? And then we decided, well, really, Bob, it was really about going to my team and saying, here's the, here's the reality of where we are uh, with everything. Um, I also went to the team and said, um, my goal is that nobody gets laid off and nobody has a decrease in pay. And I said, that's my goal. My problem is I don't know how to achieve that goal. <laughs> so, yeah, totally. So, so, so really facing the brutal facts would be like step one. And then the, the step two that is not common to my nature is ask for help and contribution from the team. And so the team came back and said, you know, we've been asked to do a live stream of our workshop forever. Like just put it on. And I just thought, man, you know, I don't know if that will work. You know, I don't know if people are going to be interested. And, uh, but they put together a plan and put together a copy that we could email people and put together a price structure that made it more affordable. And we had four times as many people sign up than we would have and it, which, which about made it about this thing. So we were able to, we were able to live, you know, another six weeks or two months. And, and then, uh, we decided, well, uh, you know, what else can we do here? And Southwest airlines had come to us before the quarantine and said, can you teach our executives how to communicate? Can you teach them to write? Can you teach them to speak and blah, blah, blah. So we were working on a, a piece of collateral called, uh, of communication made simple. And then we thought, well, what if we actually taught a one day uh, live stream on writing? And, and I've, I do not want to be a writing coach, Bob. I, I, I like working with about one friend a year to help them finish their book. 
but I, I just don't, I don't know how to, I don't know how I'm doing it. So I don't, I don't want to teach it if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. One day called Donald Miller Teaches Writing, and that was very successful. Sort of. I made the mistake of bringing up Donald Trump a couple times, so we got a bunch of refunds. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but, but uh, when you say success, how many people tuned into this? That one was 5,600 people. Do you guys you hear that? 5,600 people. This was something that was not even on the, the horizon anywhere. We will never do again. Uh, but, but it was actually very effective. I mean, people really liked it. And then we were able to pivot that. Well, really we were able to completely reinvent it. And then 10 days later recorded it with six or four cameras and a staff of 12 people. And for that Southwest airlines, I mean, it wasn't, they, they didn't ask for it or buy it, but we, we created it for, big industries to be able to be able to um, not write books or write blogs or anything, but to give speeches and create press releases. In other words, the, so the model very quickly came from we do live events to we do a live stream and then we do a sample live stream where I create curriculum. People pay us. We take that money. We hire a crew. We film a much bigger project. And now we're going to go sell that to corporate industry. Yeah. Regardless, the, 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 the down, what happened in the last two months was our cash reserves, instead of spending our cash reserves to keep people employed, we quadrupled them. So not only have we not gone into our cash reserves, we're actually in a better place than we've ever been. And so the idea of, you know, and the pivotal, the pivotal question that we asked ourselves going into this, as soon as we heard we were going to shut down, I asked the staff one question, and the question was this, what does this make possible? So instead of saying, how slowly will we die? <laughs> yes, that's a different question. <laughs> Which I was also asking that question secretly. Yes. Uh, but what does this make possible? And what it made possible was new technology, live streams, and a whole new way of doing business that we will incorporate moving forward. We, you know, we will do certainly live events because we really do love to be with our customers. Uh, but we will also do live streams so people around the world can attend probably forevermore. So yeah. that was a quick, that was a, a quick pivot. And yet it felt like it put us on a, a, the other thing that we were hearing was on these, these live stream workshops, people may have been getting more value than they were in the room. You know, they're in their homes. They're able to take notes. We've got them in small groups. There are coaches that are able to help them. You know, we create a system where people are actually getting more value uh, for a smaller price point. And, um, you know, that and also just the, the absolute grace of God. I mean, Bob, there was a time, you know, I've been building this house that I'm in now. Betsy haven't even moved, and I haven't even moved into this house. But we got the certificate of occupancy. We've been using it as a live stream studio. Um, I was... I was 50% convinced that I was going to lose it. Oh, that must have been so painful. Been two and a half years building it. It was painful a little bit, but you know, it was also really relieving to sit in with my beautiful wife and said, I never really loved the house. I love you. You moron. You know? So those were nice <laughs> conversations. And, uh, but now it looks like we're going to be able to have both. She yeah. gets to keep the moron in the house. So. Yes, she gets the whole pack. She, I keep telling Sweet Maria, she, she the Sweet Maria got the platinum deal with me. It just all of my foibles and picadillos. Um, one of the things that um, uh, might be true for somebody that's listening to this is that there was a, a pivot that you made and it worked. And then some people tried the pivot and it just didn't work. And um and so what kind of uh, advice do you have for somebody? They, they made the pivot. It was a relationship. It was a business. It was something. And it just isn't working right now. Well, I mean, you and I have been friends long enough, and you're one of the guys I call if there's a failure. And uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I still remember, I tell this Bob Goff story all the time. I tell a lot of Bob Goff stories. This is what I'm telling when people say, you know, how does, how does Bob's mind work? I call, I say, well, there was one time I was driving in Asheville, North Carolina, and I called Bob after a significant failure that was keeping me up night after night after night. And Bob left me a message, Don, I, I, I do have a solution for you. Give me a call back. So I was so excited because Bob has a solution for me. 
I call Bob and, you know, you know, what do I do about this? I don't even know if you remember this moment. I need to disguise the moment, Bob. But um, you know, I said, Bob, here's what's going on, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, oh, Don, easy, easy, easy. Here's what you do. And, and I said, what? And he said, don't think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my A game right there. <laughs> that's my re- resting like, position. You know, Bob, the things that work for you don't work for me. Um, but there's, there's, uh, you know, for me though, that, you know, I, I'm not the guy who can just not think about it. Um, I think that's a superpower of yours. You can focus on the light at the end of the tunnel and not get lost. Uh, but there, that, but I did learn something that day and, and that is not necessarily not to think about it. The, the principle holds true. And that is asking this question, you know, what does this make possible? What's the bright side of this situation? Uh, because, Failure is absolutely inevitable. It's just inevitable. Uh, and I think the other thing is that we tend to see failures as failures when they're actually almost always victories. You know, Bob, I um, I don't know if, if I've ever told you this, uh, but there was – I made an – you know, I made a bunch of money off Blue Like Jazz in some of my early books. And I put all that money into my house. I just paid off the house. And I just thought, I don't need access to this money. This money needs to go somewhere where I can't get it. And, uh, and so I paid off the house, which was a wise thing to do. And then in 2007, uh, eight, right in there, I sold that house for a lot less money than what I bought it for because the market declined. I went to go buy the house that I wanted, which had also depreciated enough that it was just an even trade. And somebody bought that house before I could get to it. So I, now I'm sitting here with hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I decided to put that into an investment and for six months and I, you know, it seemed like a good investment. I, I didn't know very much at the time and woke up on a Monday morning and had lost everything, every bit of it, all but $5,000 of my life savings. And, uh, and I remember thinking, uh, while crying myself to sleep at night, that this is the best day of your life. In terms of your career, you're going to learn more from this experience than you've ever learned, uh, before. And I kept telling myself that this is the best day of your life. I know it doesn't feel that way, but this is the best day of your life. And it's been seven years. And today, Betsy and I give to charity the amount that I lost on that day every single year. Oh, that's we, give, we give the life savings away to charity year after year after year after year after year. And and but the reason isn't some magical principle. It's literally it's literally just this: you when you fail, you are a sponge. You learn more while while you are failing or just after a failure than you possibly can when you're experiencing victory. And so never you know you never want to miss that opportunity to just it's punctuated evolution. You just grow so fast when you fail if you're open to it. And, but if you're not open to it, it'll take you down. So that, to me, that's the big principle is this idea of, of not just don't think about it, but also, you know, be a sponge in that moment. And some of the relationship failures that I've had that you've been intimate aware of, Bob, because I've always called you, um, you know, I've learned about my own codependency, my own control issues, my own in the pain of those moments, which is then you learn from that, then you change. And then now you're compatible with somebody like Betsy. And now we have this great marriage because I made so many mistakes and was able to learn from them. So I don't like, I don't want another failure. Please don't send one my way. But at the same time, if it comes, you just learn and you keep growing. Yeah. One of the things that happens, and I think for people listening, it's like joy and failure oftentimes are adjacent to one another. And so if you start uh, treating them like they're some kind of a clan war going on between them instead of saying they're cousins, like they just kind of go in pairs. You know, one of the things that comes to mind that I don't think you know about, but a huge joy was when you were rolling out the earliest iterations of what became StoryBrand. It was Storyline. And you got a, uh, uh, a theater downtown in Portland and I flew up and some other buddies and remember we emptied your house of all of its furniture to put it on the stage. Uh, so you had the, like the vibe and all that. And then we put it all away. 
And I was just, I think that was one of the happiest days, just to be with a buddy and see how many people came and were changed and all that. And then the next morning, I got up early, headed back to the airport. I got T-boned, almost killed me. I didn't tell you because I didn't want to bum you out. And so that is the hallmark of a Enneagram 7 is that uh, I probably got three blocks from your house, got hit from by somebody doing 40, totaled the car, just about totaled me. But one of the things that uh, will happen is that we mask our failures because we don't want to let our dearest friends know because I didn't want to bum you out. So I didn't tell you that I'd gotten in the mid, you know, something weird happened. And, um, and so something I've learned uh, as we've just tracked more time is the power of authenticity and all that to celebrate the beautiful things that happen, to look at the, the possibilities that might surround or be adjacent to what seems like a failure. And I really kind of regret uh, not sharing those in the moment. I feel like I've learned a bunch because I was kind of asking myself, that's kind of like, that would be by anybody's standard weird behavior. Um, and, uh, and it makes me kind of well up a little bit. Just think I didn't tell my friend, I didn't tell my kids when something weird happened when they were young. Uh, I told them instead of that, I was in the hospital. I told them that, uh, I was on a business trip for three days and, uh, and I'm like, wow, that is really weird. The reason I point this out is that for some of us, in the pivot, we're pivoting because something bad happened. And I'm just making a pitch from a guy who screws this up uh, a lot, but screwing it up a lot less now. Let people know. I don't think you need to make a setback a campsite, but you can make it known. Find somebody who loves you, who's safe, and then just let them know, I had a setback. And you don't like resist the hallmark moment where you put a bow on it and say, and then it was awesome. Just say like, no, it just like, it, was, it just didn't work out. Cost me a car, um, uh, cost me a relationship, cost me a whatever. And so I think that's part of the pivot that you seem like you're so uh, committed to a proposition that you know why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, it's making me think it's Cortez, that famous story everybody knows, where in the uh, early 1500s, after he arrived, he said, burn the ships. He wanted to make it clear to his men that no, 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 we are not going back. Uh, so uh, we're, we're just putting all the chips on red. We are going to make it happen. And taking away some options, I'm not saying taking failure away is an option. That's what they say in movies. I'm just saying walking away is not an option. And I know you've had setbacks. What can you share to uh, encourage us, the person that's listening, that tried to make the pivot, that hasn't seen the other side yet? Yeah, well, I would say you haven't finished with the pivot. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's been, it's, then the process is not done. You know, it, it, it you know, it, Bob, if, um, it, let's say that, uh, that I was uh, showing you our new home and uh, you were excited and I walked up to the door and I put the key in the door and I tried to, and it just wouldn't quite work. And so I pulled the key out and I started crying and I said, now I can't show you my home because this key doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to jiggle it or maybe the keys upside down or maybe we could like that's how you open a lock and yes and so i think a lot of times we start pivoting and we fail and we quit and we said wait a second you got to jiggle the lock you got to turn the key around you got to go see if the key's on the other keychain. you got oh. you know there's 50 different ways to get in this door and if the lock doesn't work we got a hammer in the garage let's get you know there's a way to get through this thing and so i i think um you know, we don't want to quit. We don't want to quit. And, and anymore, I just, you know, my expectations are that things are going to be beautiful and things are going to be hard. And, yeah. and, and, uh, and we, have, and they're cousins and they're cousins and they just have, they live in tension with each other and it's never going to be perfect. And the, the whole idea is just to keep your feet moving, you know, and keep going forward. Yeah. I think the, uh, among my least favorite, Phrases and they're always well intentioned, but um, uh, in particularly in a faith community, that God shut the door. I'm like, you've had this ambition for 20 years. You asked Billy, you put the key in the lock. Uh, Billy said no, and you think God shut the door. I'm like, <laughs> I, no, Billy said no. That's what happened. 
If you can't get in through the front door, spin the house and make the back door look like the front door. Um, but but find a way in there. And I think one thing I've learned among many things from you is the idea of having a plan. You were on social media within hours of Earth stopping its spin, um, talking about developing a plan coming up um, with a checklist. I know even in uh, when I learned how to fly so we could get in and out of the lodge, the first thing they do is they give you a checklist. Uh, if you get on an airplane, which people actually used to do at one point, if you turn to the right, you find your seat. If you turn to the left, you go to jail. But if you look in the door, um, the pilots who've flown hundreds of thousands of hours have checklists. And so even in the little planes I fly, there's a checklist. I'm not kidding. The first thing on the checklist is clean the window. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Yeah. I, I don't care if you're flying an F-16. Uh, the checklist will say clean the window. And here's why. Because these little bugs that get on the window, they look like 747s that are far away later. So you'll, you'll confuse the little bug with something great big far away. And so I just think, I know there's that classic book, Make Your Bed. I just think, like, just clean the window. Um, start over again. So tell us some of the things that are on your checklist. When you uh, think about making a pivot, tell us some of the things that we might be thinking about if we put a checklist together. For me, you know, one of them is the doomsday scenario. You know, you're going to automatically believe the worst case scenario is going to happen. And so for me, it's this, the first thing on the checklist is remind yourself that that's probably not true. Uh, that, that, the, that the worst case scenario actually does not, you don't have to lose the house. You know, this doesn't have to be God teaching you a lesson that you got uh, too big for your britches and you built a house that you weren't going to be able to finish. You know, those are the doomsday kind of scenarios that you're actually an ace at that. I mean, you're an ace at just going to the positive really quickly. I think others of us like me have to sort of fight it a little more. Uh, but that's the that's the very first thing. And, and even just being aware that the worst case scenario does not have to be true frees you up to act in such a way that you can decrease the percentage chance that it will. You know, so so that's the, you know, for me, that's the first thing. And then in terms of business, you know, it was really right back to, the basics of how we got this thing started, you know, how can we add value to our customers right now? How can we do that? What, what can we offer that is extremely valuable to our customers right now? Um, and then, uh, and then for me, we, we just reverse engineered a plan you know, from that point on and we're sort of shocked and then really quickly realized, you know, from my perspective now, looking back two months on when the quarantine started, um, what I realize now that I didn't realize then is this is a much more ripe market for everything that we do than the one before. That, Isn't that crazy? You know, that, and and, and it took why, that circumstance. Yeah. Why didn't I see it that way from the beginning that we've just been handed the greatest opportunity to scale this company up that we've ever been handed. Instead, it was automatic thinking it was doomsday when, uh, right. And so this is the, uh, you know, this is the guy who, who's dating and, and his, he, he finds out his girlfriend went to see her old boyfriend and he loses it before realizing she went to say, I've met somebody else and I love him and I never love you. <laughs> He's like, wait, don't overreact. This might be a really good thing. Yes. Like you're, you're like two or three bits of information away from finding out what's really going on. So, you know, and, but it's really uncomfortable not to know what's going on. It's really uncomfortable to live with the space of, well, we don't actually know the answer to that just yet. That's a fog and we're going to not react to fog. We're going to wait till we see what's in the fog. I like the, uh, there's a scene in Apollo 13 when everything goes wrong, they stir the tanks, the oxygen blows up, whatever it is. And back at uh, mission control, they're saying, okay, let's just look at this from the concept of what works. Cause it was a time that just didn't seem like anything worked. This didn't work. That didn't work. The batteries are going dead. They're going to have to go into the limb. Hey, there was a, a list of all the stuff that didn't work. But rather than uh, lamenting that to say, well, OK, what do we got to work with? And so you can put on your checklist a couple things that you're going to do. You can make some rules and maybe even question some of the rules that you've made before about how StoryBrand works. Now, evidently, StoryBrand is doing a lot of things uh, online. Uh, our friends at OnSite. You know, they're, they have a new rule. We do online stuff, and I don't think they did before, and, and it's going fabulously. 
No, I, I think the whole world is kind of moving that direction. You know, Betsy taught me something, and, and you've reiterated this idea too. My wife is very good at not um, responding to sort of negative emotions. She can wait them out until she's in a better place. And I'm somebody who I, I feel like I have to be so authentic that if I feel something, I need to act on it, or otherwise I'm lying. And I've discovered, no, that's not lying. That's the lack of wisdom. Is what that is. <laughs> <laughs> but so you, 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 you used to call it, Bob, don't give that, don't give that voice any airtime. You know, like if you have a negative voice, don't hand on the microphone and let them talk because this is, you know, don't give that voice any airtime. And I think that's a really important thing to remember in times of stress and anxiety. Hey, don't give that any airtime. It's okay to think it and feel it, but don't actually let it be put into action. Always, you know, this is a, a crazy thing to say, but play the percentages. If there's a 5% chance things are going to go well, play that percentage. <laughs> right? like, yeah. You know, try to increase that percentage as much as you possibly can. And I think I'd surround yourself with some truth. I have some friends that we've been visiting about putting up three by five cards with truths, like a uh, like axioms, things that are truth. Uh, and I don't just mean positive affirmations, you're beautiful, you're swell, you're dashing, uh, and that's fine. But but to say things that are true in my life, uh, that the time that I invest in my family is never wasted, uh, that the pain I experience is never wasted, that they, you can actually put on your checklist to say, I'm getting those cards out. I'm going to get things that, uh, without respect to the circumstances right now, these are, the, these are the rules that we play. These are the rules for engaging those difficult circumstances. Remember that movie Fight Club? There was, a, there was four rules in Fight Club. The first rule, never talk about Fight Club. <laughs> the second rule, never talk about Fight Club. The third rule is when somebody cries uncle, like when they say they're out, then the fight's over. But the fourth rule is you only fight one person at a time. And so one of the rules that I would make for myself would be instead of fighting many battles in the middle of a lot of chaos, just pick one, like just take on one and to say it's me and that right now and start with the stuff that matters the most. It's you and Betsy. It's me and sweet Marie. And we'd say, we're going to go get that one sorted before we figure out all the rest of the stuff. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful. I mean, it, it's so necessary. Um, I love that idea. Everyone has at least one or two books inside them waiting to be written. Maybe you can relate. You have a story to share, a message to deliver, something that needs to be said, but you're probably stuck like so many people who are wondering, could I be an author? How would I even go about writing in a compelling way? How do I write a book? That's why we put together a new interactive digital course called Author Class with Bob Goff. He's a best-selling author a few times over whose style of writing has inspired millions, and he's learned a lot about the book business along the way. Author Class includes teaching videos with Bob and a seven-part framework to guide you to write great content and get your book out into the world. You can sign up for the digital class right now. Go to dreambigframework.com slash courses and get started on Author Class with Bob Goff. And then I think what we do is we're kind of land in the plane is uh, pick a couple, like re remind yourself of your ambition. Uh, you are the guy behind for those that have been following Dream Big. Dream Big happened because Don and Tim and Day and I sat in a room. Uh, Don gave us time and Tim gave us his weekend. Uh, we put together what was going to be Dream Big. And we said, what are the ideas we'd want to talk to people about? And one of the first women that came to a Dream Big event, uh, we were talking about her ambition and everybody was going around. One person wanted to cure cancer and somebody else wanted to land on the moon. And you know what her ambition was? She said, I want to dance. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. And I said, well, like, tell me a little bit more because we hadn't gotten to know each other. She'd actually had been involved in a, a really big accident and had had countless operations on her foot. And, uh, and she could never dance because uh, of the damage that was done. It never got, you know what she did? It was probably six or eight weeks before we got together. She had her foot cut off and she got a plastic foot. She, she said, I'm gonna learn how to dance. And she was willing to do whatever it took to get to her ambition. Isn't that just beautiful? I think about that 
constantly. If you could pick an ambition that you would actually say, I will part with whatever is necessary. And I would pick an ambition that would be worthy of that kind of sacrifice. I would pick a relationship. I wouldn't pick a business that would be that kind of sacrifice. That doesn't mean work hard. Don't don't work hard on the business. But I would say pick some things that are worthy of the sacrifice you're willing to make. And then you can pick many. I would only do one fight at a time, but I would pick many ambitions and then just see where you have an opportunity. And that's what you're doing right now. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this, if, if you're inspired by this conversation, because Bob won't say it, but uh, the, the book Dream Big is the book you want to buy. I mean, it, because when I think about, um, you know, the ability to sort of pivot from a writing career to a business, that's something I wanted to do that almost nobody wanted me to do. They wanted me to write another book. And I just thought, I, I, want, I really want to help businesses figure out how to do their marketing and tell their stories, which almost seems like a lesser form of art. And yet, because I did that, you know, we've helped thousands of businesses and Betsy and I get to build this, you know, resort house that feels like the lodge in Nashville. And, uh, you know, we get to do all these things. And, you know, I would say one of the things that Dream Big you know, talk, talks about is, you know, that dream is in you and other people might not understand it, uh, but you're going to have to help them understand it. You know, um, Henry Ford said, if they'd, if, if I'd have asked people what they wanted me to build, they would have said a faster horse. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> They're not going to be able to figure it out. Right. And you, you know what it is and whatever it is, it's, it's going to inspire people. Um, so yeah, that's what we do. We, you know, as a company, we help people clarify their marketing messages and you can learn more about that at, at storybrand.com. But it's been, you know, there's really been two kind of amazing seasons of my life. One was the, the years I got to spend at Reed College, uh, you know, working with students at Reed College, at Blue Like Jazz, and then meeting you and a million miles in a thousand years. That all came out of that season. And this really is, it feels like a whole second I can't believe I get a second season where you get to you get to feel like magic is coming and Bob I really believe there'll be a third one I really do uh, before I go I think I, I would love to run for office and maybe run for Congress or Senate here in the state of Tennessee at some point uh, and you know if that happens it's a third I mean who gets three yeah right and so, and, but you, 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 you know, you had the, the years where you met Maria and got married. Then you had the years where you were a successful lawyer. Now you own a, own a camp and are a best selling author. And I think maybe one of the things that you and I have in common is when everybody else is saying, well, you should do this, you just go, no, that story's done. Uh, the, let's roll the credits on that. We're going to do a new one. And, yeah. uh, and you get to live multiple lives inside of, of, your one life. It's actually just fantastic. Just getting kind of current with where God has you, who God's made you to be, and then with a keen focus on who you're turning into instead of all the focus on who you used to be. Uh, like more about calling, less about capabilities. And the thing about calling has always felt a little bit, not manipulative, but uh, a, a little bit tricky in that I get a lot of phone calls, um, but, and Jesus has never called me once. But there's a lot of indications. Uh, there's indications, it's not just affirmation from people, but it's where you have an ambition that's worth pursuing. It's worth losing a foot over. It's intersecting that with an opportunity that comes along. And then just being unafraid and then just trying it, taking action on it. Um, but, but to do it wisely, <laughs> I've, uh, sailed back. We got to do this, uh, sometime, but like, uh, I've sail across the Pacific and we've done it a couple times. Oh, my friend took a boat, uh, the year before I went, yeah, I was asking him for some tips on like, so, you know, what, what are things to do? Like bring lots of seasick pills and all that. But he said, uh, be careful uh, what you, when you top up the uh, top off the tanks. And like, what do you mean? This is what he did. He set out from Oahu. The last thing he did, he topped off the diesel tanks with water, and he topped off the water tanks with diesel. He put about two gallons of each. And what ended up happening, he had a decision to make about 200 miles from. Uh, Honolulu, when he realized what he had done, would he turn back and go fix that or press on? And so he did what you and I would do, which is press on. But 
because there's water in the diesel, the engines died. And so because he had no engines, he had no batteries, so he had no lights, and he sailed across the Pacific with a compass. He had no navigation, no lights, no nothing. So one of the things I want us to do, this is going to be a long journey for some people. You're pivoting. Uh, I want you to be, be really wise about the people that are around you. Find voices that you can trust. Uh, don't be uh, listening to naysayers. That's just topping off the water with diesel. Uh, and don't top off the, the diesel with water either. You have some things that have worked in the past. Continue to pursue those. And and I think uh, if you need a shot in the arm, some of the folks, the principals, there's a book, Story Brand. Um, I think the live event is uh, runs laps around that. Uh, and I think it's just because you get to interact individually. What, what happens at a Story Brand event, Don? Well, we actually put you in, you know, right now in live streams, we put you in a, a Zoom call with 12 other business leaders, and then you watch a live stream while you're doing that. So for two days, you clarify your story, the message of your company, Then you, you use the sound bites that you come up with in your marketing collateral, and we teach you to create the, the exact marketing collateral that you need in order to scale your business. Uh, and so you end up, what you end up doing is revolutionizing all your marketing within 48 hours rather than four years. And, uh, and you, you have a coach there to help you figure out how to do it. Uh, and so, you know, there's the internal story of what I'm going to do with my life and my business. And then there's the external story of what, how, what words am I going to use to tell other people about it so they buy in. And we're the story brand. Big dream is about the internal battle. Story brand is about the external battle. You know, the internal battle, who am I and what am I going to be doing? And then story brand comes along after that and says, okay, now that you know what you're going to be doing, how do you tell people about it in such a way that you can scale it? So that's kind of, we, we do the story brand part. So you guys, wherever it is that you're listening, wherever you pulled over, if you found a wide spot in the road, do courageous things. It's a checklist. It's uh keeping your eyes on your own paper. It's not waiting for permission and not letting other people decide who you are, but to actually to say, hey, who's the newest version of me and how am I going to pivot? Don, thanks a million for uh, taking some time to talk to us. I always love talking about Thanks. All right, Bob. So obviously we got to listen in on two really close friends talk about stuff that's so important and significant in your lives. I'm, I guess I'm curious for the listeners Maybe you can give us a little sneak peek behind the scenes with you. What's had to change in your work? We know you're a speaker all over the world. You're not speaking. You're yeah. not risking on planes. What have you changed? <laughs> it's like going to a monastery, you know, where it's just like one of those silent retreats, but it goes for months and months and months. Right. <laughs> yeah, Forced. you can't talk to anybody. So I think the whole idea, if you wrap your identity and your business plan into one set of realities and then things change, if you're a sword swallower and then you get the hiccups, <laughs> it's an identity crisis, <laughs> right? Uh, but instead, what I've done is I've tried to just pivot with this. And so, uh, we were doing the podcast before. We'll continue to do that because we really hope that there's something in this. We don't monetize it. We don't have advertisers. We do it because we just want people to connect with important things. Yet, at the same time, I write books. And so what a great time to write a book. We've got a Dream Big book coming out so that people can access that. Um, we've also done coaching. I've just said, let's go a mile deep with a small number of people. And so there's a small number of people that we're doing coaching with, and it's really been beautiful. Those are actually some of the highlights of the week to go deeper with fewer people. And then the final thing, this camp I bought, <laughs> I'm spending yeah. all my time. I'm headed up there actually in a couple minutes and I'm spending my time. I think that's the next version of me. And I hope as you're listening, maybe there's something that Don said, maybe it was something that you thought that an idea ricocheted off another idea to say the next version of you. And what I want you to do is get busy. I want you to be diligent. I want you to uh, kind of vet that idea, know why that is, that you're not just going for the applause, but you're actually doing that because it's a, the best, newest expression of who you are. Yeah, something that stuck out for me that Don said, and the way he's responded to this crisis was tapping into his team, asking questions to the people around him. And I think that's obviously so wise. I know when I get overwhelmed, which I have been the past few weeks, uh, I tend to just focus on myself and put my head down, but actually picking my head up, making a couple calls, asking people around me 
to help me see what I can't see has been really productive for me. Yeah. And uh, discouragement can happen along the way. You have an ambition, you're listening, and you just have this thing. You wanted to write a book or start a play or whatever it was that you wanted. And then you got discouraged along the way. And I think it's just worth uh, checking the return address on that. Um, are we trying to win arguments with people that are no longer in our lives, uh, that we're reacting to some of those things? So I'm just saying, let's figure out the return address, and you'll know that it's coming from Jesus if it has to do with uh, loving people well and loving people selflessly, being a very humble version of yourself. So as you launch into this week, I want you to think about some of the things that Don and I were talking about, but then I want you to pivot in your own life and to say, okay, so who's new me? What am I good at? What am I capable of? And what's my next step? Not all the steps, just the next one. Thanks for listening, folks. We'll see you next week for another episode of the Dream Big Podcast with Bob Goff and friends. The Dream Big Podcast finally has a book to go along with it. Bob's new book called Dream Big is now available for pre-order. Go to thedreambigbook.com to pre-order your copy today.